Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to take the first half of this presentation, which is kind of the more technical bits, talking about the platform, and then the co-founder of the project, Chance Kokenauer, will take the second half talking about sort of the community development and some of the issues that are coming up around the project. Um, the first part I want to touch on is just how this platform is built. Um, for those of you who maybe haven't heard the new name Recre, this was formerly Project Mosul and we've renamed it because people misunderstood uh, the, the kind of global emphasis and chance, we'll touch on that later, uh, but it is uh, Recre now. And it is a web platform for reconstructing lost heritage. This is destroyed heritage. Our specific focus is on that because politically speaking, it's a lot easier to deal with stuff that's gone. Um, but we're crowdsourcing this um, and it's not limited to that which is destroyed by human intervention, but it includes things in natural uh, disasters such as what happened in Nepal. Um, it's a completely open source platform. In fact, all of you today could download the code, relaunch your own website and uh, compete with us if you want to, but we'd rather that people all work together instead uh, and that you contribute to, to the creation and ma maintenance of such a platform. Um, users are primarily contributing content. Uh, so they're uploading photos of different places that they've gone to. Uh, for example, Syria, we get tons and tons of photos from Palmyra because it was a very touristed place after the sort of digital camera revolution. So, um, you know, when people actually had either smartphones or, or digital uh, SLRs that they could take with them. Um, pattern matching, I'm kind of throwing this out there because people think of the computer vision and being able to um, match photos. This is still a task that is better done by human beings. So by crowdsourcing that, having people look at photos, find um, similar things in the photographs and grouping them together into uh, groupings of reconstructions that could then be processed by other people. Um, and so then the data processing is also happening by the community. So uh, once there's a grouping of photos together, people will download those onto their own computer, um, process that themselves uh, using whatever photogrammetric software they like, uh, and continue going from there. And then interestingly, the idea of the narrative building, the retelling uh, of the story of these different uh, pieces that we've lost along the way. So we have a very concrete example that Chance will share later on, uh, but you know, this is open for people, maybe something as simple as annotations in Sketchfab, which we're using as our viewer, uh, where people can talk about different pieces of a reconstructed piece of lost heritage uh, and retell the story. So basically, the community is doing everything on there and we're providing a place that people can make that happen. So this is to kind of walk you through what the site actually looks like. Um, someone lands on the page, they're presented with this global map, uh, which identifies different pieces. Clustered, obviously, I mean, if we tried to show every piece in the Middle East right now, um, it would get lost. It is interesting to say that people tend to focus more on the Middle East right now, even though really there's a lot of lost heritage in other parts of the world. So it would be, um, you know, I think part of what happens is that as news stories come out to the media or through the media, the public hears about it, they think about it, and they say, oh yeah, you know, I'll, I'll identify this on there, even though really we could have uh, pins dropped across the globe here representing where cultural heritage has been lost. Um, once they uh, go to the site, so this represents the location. This is, uh, they've clicked on the pin, they're looking at Palmyra right now, uh, and it gives different counts here. Um, you can ignore the reconstructions to process because we're having to rewrite that algorithm a little bit to identify what those numbers actually look like. Um, and we're not really requiring people to mask the images. We're trying to still work together with MicroPass. They have a great masking um, feature. We want to plug it in through that. Um, so people will just kind of be offloaded to their uh, masking part. Um, but what they do see are the images to sort. That's the main task that we need to have happen to be able to do anything in the first place. So you can see at the bottom of the page, there's reconstructions already in place. Um, and that's the sort of thing that um, they're then grouping the images. So at the moment when this was taken, there were 228 images at the location of Palmyra that had not been sorted into some sort of relevant group. Um, as soon as they've logged into the web page, they can upload images. That's the only thing people need to do to be able to make a change on the website is to create a, a, an account. Um, other than that, they can't destroy anything. So people can edit, but no one can delete uh, except the admins. Um, once they go to one of these reconstruction groups, you can see that they have the different um, photos that are available there. They can download the originals. Um, they can remove a, an image from that reconstruction group. They're able to then add other images. So these are all the images at the location. And you just go through, click on the different add buttons, and it 
uh, includes those within the group. Um, so in summary, the, the way that this is working, people are identifying lost heritage, again, coming from the community. They're uploading photos to that, uh, to those locations identified in step one. Uh, they're organizing, organizing these photos into some sort of relevant groupings of like images so that they can then process a reconstruction, uh, which currently users are downloading to their computer and doing that. And then they have the ability to retell a story based on that reconstructed um, lost heritage. So the web platform is providing a space for people from around the globe to actively participate in preserving the memory of lost heritage. And we emphasize that because, of course, this sort of crowdsource reconstruction produces um, nothing that is very scientifically useful. But visually, it is a strong reminder of the memory of the heritage that was lost along the way. I want to touch on a few other things uh, before I pass this over to, to Chance. Uh, we do have kind of a closed part, the site administration, so we can see um, the different uh, ways that we can interact with it. Um, you know, we're able to manage the user community. Uh, you can see right there we have 329, it was actually 330 as a few minutes ago. Uh, users lined, uh, signed up onto the website. Um, you can see the sort of uh, assets and images, and we're able to go through that. We can do all the management um, from our side there. Um, we're working on different integrations. This is probably the most interesting one. It's actually finished, but it's um, still too process intensive for the sort of web hosting that we have at the moment. Um, but based on location, because obviously people are dropping pins on the location, we actually then have this go out to Flickr, search for all the images with open licenses um, that are at that same location. And you see the slider bar uh, up there at the top. You can adjust the meters from that location on there. So, you know, within 20 meters, of that pen, you assume that more or less you might find some things. But people who are manually geotagging a big batch of images, they may just go to the middle of Palmyra, upload all of their photos from it. So you might need to extend it out a little bit to find the occasional um, other image that you want. But then they're able to just hit import. It imports that image with all the appropriate metadata as well. Where did that image come from? What license did that image actually have in the first place? Who is the author of it? The different URLs that would point back to the original item so that the Flickr images can also be included in the reconstruction. We're also looking at different ways that we can speed up this process. Pre-matching of the images would be a great thing to do so that we could sort images that are more likely to, to be associated to the top of the page. But again, this requires the kind of computer vision things that are very process intensive. Um, and right now, our project we're doing in a, out of our free time and out of our own bank accounts. So uh, I don't quite have the money to pay for the larger web instances to make that happen. Um, we want to generate a sort of quality control or rating for the different images so that we could say, here's a five-star image, uh, image that has its EXIF data that maybe is uh, X amount of megapixels that you know is acquired in a certain way from a certain type of sensor. Um, and that would be a better image to use for it versus someone who may, maybe takes a screen capture of something that they've seen on the web and uploads it to the website thinking that, hey, this would work for photogrammetry. Um, we would also like to see... Um, a sort of cloud-based photogrammetric processing where people don't have to then download these to their computer, but they can just simply push a button when they finish a reconstruction group, said process this, and have it go out to the web. Um, so we're working on different uh, sort of cloud processing solutions that we can use for that. Um, we have a really exciting new visual experience that will be launched in the ne next few weeks, and it will go through several iterations that will be a major part of the storytelling initiative. I can't say much more about that at the point, uh, but it is coming. Uh, there's gamification aspect that we'd like to put in there, which is basically a way that people can track their activity, you know, and it's it, it tends to drive people to do more. So, you know, you could say, yeah, I've sorted 500 images, I've done 30 reconstructions, whatever it might be. Um, and then, but people would be able to, to opt in for that because from the beginning, we've had this as a completely anonymous platform because of the sensitivity of the region that we were focused on. Um, but now mm, it's not really as much of an issue anymore. So people may still want to remain anonymous in their activity on the website, but if people are interested in, you know, participating in that gamification as aspect, they can. Um, and then a personal dashboard, so you can kind of see the things that you are actively working on, see if other people of the community are also working on that. So you have the, uh, the sort of collaborative nature of it. And then things like user-curated virtual galleries, where they can then take those uh, virtual reconstructions and create their own museum galleries to retell stories of that lost heritage. Uh, and I'm going to pass it over to Chance now. Thank you.
And so I am going to, uh, in the last 10 minutes of the presentation, speak to you about what we've been able to accomplish basically in the last 12 months uh, of this project. So, of course, as Matthew has mentioned before, Project Mosul started uh, last March. It actually started uh, two weeks after the video that was released by the self-proclaimed Islamic State and their destruction of artifacts in the Mosul Museum. So we, uh, we basically talked about this idea. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the uh, a very uh, early crowdsourcing effort to reconstruct lost heritage in the case of Afghanistan and the researchers at ETH uh, Zurich back around 2001, 2002. So we had, we had heard of this before, but I don't, we really didn't uh, see any other examples of this existing. Uh, so we didn't know what to do with it. On one hand, we had these ideas. We also reached out to, we are both archaeologists, but we both work in remote sensing and photogrammetry. And so we reached out to people in the archaeology community within uh, Iraq area, people who study in Iraq as as well as the general uh, archaeological uh, context that we both have. And as the project began to grow, I guess the project, we thought maybe we would receive the interest of 25 or 30 people who may have had a few images taken from a museum in Mosul, in this case, that had practically zero uh, it was, it was it had been closed since the US invasion in 2003. So you can imagine how difficult this would be in comparison to Palmyra. So you really have to think about it in a temporal and spatial uh, context. And so the project going from Project Mosul to Recre was basically a decision that we made in order to represent the global focus of lost heritage, uh, both by human and natural me means, and as well as promoting the positive narrative of digital preservation. So in one case, once once the project began to leap outside of the, the Middle East, in, in the case of following the earthquake in Nepal last April, and this is just part of our growing network of partners because we have no, we're actually doing this project completely with zero funds. So it's all about getting other people involved in partners. So in this case, it was the Berlin uh, DLR Surveying uh, Association, the government organization that had done high altitude uh, image acquisition of the Himalayan mountain range before the earthquake. They were in contact with a client of theirs that creates photogrammetric software in Stuttgart named N-Frames. The software is called Shure. It's free for academic use, so you may want to look into that. And they were able to produce this before and after uh, model. And then working with Sketchfab, they produced the viewer that you see here and you would find on our website that allows you to click before and after, rotate around the model, and, and actually really see the difference between uh, the destruction in Durbar Square in Kathmandu as one example. So yes, we decided late last year to rebrand the project because everyone was assuming by hearing it in the media, Project Mosul, then you're only working in the Mosul area, maybe Hatra and Nimrud or Nineveh. But we said, no, we're actually doing this on a global scale. So Recre uh, is, it, it, it's to recreate in Esperanto. And that was basically the idea to use uh, a word from a language that represents, uh, a, you know, at least a more international um, borderless uh, representation. The results are, of course, the web-based open source platform that Matthew presented um, and spoke about before. The growing volunteer community that we have, the public 3D and 4D gallery, because we do have before and after models integrated as one, and the growing network of the private and public partners, which is the only reason really our project can continue to develop. Thanks to the coverage in media, unfortunately, thanks to uh, unfortunately, due to the destruction, it's then covered in the media. They contact us and we do stories about it and it's covered in various media sources. That is then, uh, that is particularly connected to the involvement of volunteers learning about the project, uploading images to our site. So you can actually, we have graphs to show that when the destruction of Palmyra occurred, we had an enormous spike in image uploads and volunteer uh, in, in involvement, engagement in the community because people, non-experts and experts alike would like to find a way to make a more positive story and find something that they can do when they feel like they're constricted by just watching this negative news uh, on, on the television. So some specific results that I just wanted to highlight is one, this was the initial idea of the project was uh, to recreate the artifacts using crowdsourced uh, images from the Mosul Museum only and having someone create a virtual museum of Mosul and put those objects back into the museum and create a positive story and narrative for people to learn about what had happened. And that has actually been done in less than 12 months. Now, thanks to the Economist Media Lab reaching out to us, this will be released for the public 
to view on Google Cardboard, Samsung Gear, uh, I believe Oculus as well, on all devices for free in the next few weeks. So that will be very, that will be, I have a pretty large public uh, release there, as well as being supported by the Iraqi Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities, UNESCO's Unite for Heritage, Gilgamesh Center, and most importantly, where our story comes from, is uh, the Mosul Cultural Museum, who we have uh, contacted and spoke in length with the curators from that museum, as well as the ex-director of the museum. So generating 3D content, I mean, uh, Matthew and I both work in archaeology. We're both, uh, we work on many projects in both uh, Central America, the Near East. We use photogrammetry, we use laser scanning. We understand the, the advantages, the disadvantages of creating and using this technology for digital preservation. In this case, as Matthew pointed out before, it is particularly uh, unique because the heritage is gone. So if someone wanted to say, well, you know, and, and I agree that obviously with 15 images taken from one side of the line of Mosul here in the Mosul Museum, although this is the virtual museum that will be released soon, that's not the real one. Um, of course, the images that were taken from the side that you see here were only taken because the line itself was positioned against a wall. This is not uh, we were not working in a, you know, this is not a case of archaeological investigation where you remove the object and you, you do a planned acquisition. This is basically trying to salvage what we can from what has been lost by photographs or images and data that people have uh, acquired previously. Another, of course, interesting uh, concept, and many people are working with 3D printing. Of course, this is important uh, for museum curation projects or public outreach. And in that case, we also came to another realization. Well, we don't have enough images to complete the, you know, to uh, produce a complete 3D model of this. But the same is true in, in uh, museums when uh, someone is restoring an, a statue, for example, in Athens, and they only have the hand and the torso of a figure. Well, they, of course, connected and they put uh, some white, you know, they, it's very clear, uh, there's a very clear difference between. So what we did is, this is a 3D colored print, and what you see of the color is from the images that were used for the reconstruction. But then the white parts here and the white across the back and part of the pedestal that the line is setting on, that is, of course, added afterwards. So we're being completely upfront with the public and anyone about what this 3D print represents. And at the International Documentary Film Festival last fall uh, in Amsterdam, they invited us, uh, the Economist Media Lab basically organized this. They had the early version of the virtual museum, so three people at one time could sit down and put on a Samsung Gear uh, device to, to navigate around and listen to a podcast that was made by certain interviews from experts, uh, including the British Museum, discussing the, the project and, and the narrative, as well as the three 3D printed objects sitting on pedestals behind that also had a slideshow of images being projected on the wall behind each object of the images that were used to make that reconstruction. And we found, and I, I was personally there, and it was uh, very impressive for, uh, to see the public come in and, and really realize where this technology, many people weren't even aware of what 3D printing could be done or even if 3D printing could be done in color. So this was really uh, interesting to many, many groups of people. And then moving forward in some of the directions that we have ideas for in the project is, the democ is, is actually one of the most important uh, topics or themes to our project is the democratization of cultural heritage and the the integration or sorry not the integration the public engagement aspect that you mentioned before because that is one very important quality to projects such as this so in using uh, the term for the project uh, exploring oceans of data there are oceans of data out there and Hopefully, academia, industry, and the general public, as this project has proven, can pull together and, and create something out of this. But out of those oceans of data, there are also little islands of someone's hard disk space, uh, external hard drive, that they have been storing all their photographs from all of their world travels that is something that is an untapped resource. So, you know, having Flickr integration or integration with other types of image uh, 
um, internet-based repositories for images is one thing, but another is actually engaging in, in, in getting people to actually send us their images or even hearing about it because we find that most people would like to donate and participate. So we're digging deeper into uh, how to work with lost heritage in that way, empowering refugee students at my university, University of Stuttgart Institute for Photogrammetry in southern Germany. I actually have a student from Syria who is studying an engineering degree. He wants to do his master's now. Uh, particularly on this topic and engaging with other Syrian refugees within the community that are coming to Germany in a way to kind of build a, a positive narrative but do it from an engineering and remote sensing background and, and kind of exploring that. And of course new ideas in public engagement is kind of our, our focus. So uh, Doc, thank you for your time and we would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. <laughs>